Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 2 of Introductory Astronomy. This is part 1 and we're mostly going to talk about the history of astronomy which you will not be tested on but at the end of this lecture we're going to cover sections 2.5 through 2.6 which is Kepler's laws which are really important. So if you like you can go ahead and fast forward to those or you can listen to the whole lecture. Taking a look at this opening slide picture, clockwise from upper left, it shows four very amazing astronomers of the 20th century. The first one is Harlow Shapley, 1885 to 1972. He was the one who first discovered our place, our location in the Milky Way. Annie Cannon on the top right, 1863 to 1941. She classified almost a million stars over a 50 year career. So that's pretty amazing. Carl Jansky on the bottom left, 1905 to 1950. He was the first one to detect radio radiation coming from our own galaxy. And Edwin Hubble on the bottom right, 1889 to 1953, you may have heard of him, he's very famous, he was the first to discover the expansion of the universe. So let's go ahead and start with the units of chapter 2. Again, you will not be tested on sections 2.1 through 2.4 but 2.5 through 2.8 are very, very, very important. Now, before we begin, I just want to make a small comment about Galileo. About four centuries ago, he was condemned by the Inquisition for his part in a huge controversy at the time, and that controversy was the nature of the universe. And there were two main issues on that. The first one was the location of our planet. Was it the center of the universe or was the sun at the center? So that was a big issue at the time. And a related idea to that was the nature of planetary motion. Ancient astronomers could see the sun, moon, and planets moving along the ecliptic but they couldn't describe those motions precisely. So in order to solve the problem of where is the Earth located, astronomers also had to solve the second problem of planetary motion. So we're going to start from the beginning on what is called archaeoastronomy, which is the study of the astronomy of ancient people, of our ancestors. Now, ancient civilizations observed the skies and they were very interested in what was happening. And how do we know that? Well, a lot of them, even though they did not leave any written records, they built structures to mark significant astronomical events. This picture right here shows summer solstice sunrise as Stonehenge. This is in south of England and we believe it was constructed as a primitive calendar. The inset shows that little picture right there on the top right, the actual sunrise at Stonehenge at summer solstice. As seen from the center of the stone circle, the sun rose directly over the heel stone on the longest day of the year. And I put a little link there to a YouTube video that shows how that took place with a solstice uh, reconstruction at that location. Now keep in mind that even though the builders of Stonehenge had no written language and left no records of their intentions, they did leave these big monuments. And England is, was not the only place where you can find this. Um, a lot of them are found in continental Europe and it shows that primitive people were actually paying close attention to the sky. So the roots of astronomy lie not in sophisticated science and logic but in human curiosity and wonder. This next one right here 
It's in the ancient Native American settlement known as Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. So sunlight is shining between two slabs of stone high on the side of a 440 foot high Fajada Butte to form a dagger of light on the cliff face. About noon on the day of the summer solstice, the dagger, which is approximately the size of a dinner plate, this the dagger of light slices through the center of a spiral pegged into the sandstone. And I also put another link on YouTube so you can see a small video of that. Now this is a picture of spokes of the bighorn medicine wheel and they're aligned with the rising and setting of the sun and other stars and this is in Wyoming and it was built by the Plains Indians. Another quote-unquote observatory in the Americas is at the Caracol Temple in Mexico. It was built by the Mayan civilization and it has some windows, if you notice there, that seem to align with astronomical events. So this suggests that at least part of Caracol's function may have been to keep track of the seasons and the heavens. So what did ancient obs astronomers observe? Well, they observed the sun, the moon, some stars, and five planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. This is a picture of Turkish astronomers at work. During the Dark Ages, much scientific information was preserved and new discoveries were made by astronomers in the Islamic world as shown in the 16th century manuscript. Now the sun, moon and stars in general all have simple movements in the sky. But if you observe the planets, they move with respect to fixed stars. They change in brightness, they change in speed and they undergo what we call retrograde motion. So most of the time planets move from west to east relative to the background stars. Occasionally, roughly once per year, they change direction and temporarily undergo retrograde motion, meaning they move from east to west before they loop back. So this illustration here shows an actual retrograde loop in the motion of the planet Mars. The inset depicts the movements of several planets over the course of several years as reproduced on the inside dome of a planetarium. The motion of the planets relative to the stars represented as unmoving points, produces continuous streaks on the planetarium sky. And this picture is from the Boston Museum of Science. Now we have what's called inferior planets, Mercury and Venus. Inferior planets are the planets that have orbits closer to the Sun than the Earth. And superior planets, Mars, Jupiter and Sun, we have, which have orbits further away. So that's a diagram of the Earth's orbit and two other possible planetary orbits. An inferior orbit lies between the Earth's orbit and the superior orbit outside. The points noted on the orbits indicate times when a planet appears to come close to the Sun, which we call conjunction, or is diametrically opposite the Sun on the celestial sphere, which we call opposition. Now, if you'd like to read uh, more on that, there's a, a very nice discussion in the text. 
So the instead is a schematic representation of the orbit of an inferior planet relative to the sun as seen from the Earth. So the early astronomers made those observations. They could tell that the inferior planets were never too far from the sun. The superior planets themselves were not tied to the sun and they exhibited what we call the retrograde motion, that looping motion we talked about. They also seem to be brightest at opposition and inferior planets, on the other hand, were brightest near the inferior conjunction. So that's what early astronomers were able to observe. So based on those observations, they came up with models. So the earliest models, of course, had the Earth at the center of the solar system. It makes sense to think that we're in the middle of everything. Also, based on what they observed, it did make sense. Now, the only problem with that is that you needed lots of calculations to quote-unquote accurately track the planetary motions. And they couldn't do that very well either. And remember how we talked about scientific theory and how it should be simple and elegant? This was anything but. Take a look at this, this picture right here. It is very complicated. This is what we call the Ptolemaic model. The basic features which are drawn roughly to scale are based on Ptolemy's geocentric model of the inner solar system. Geocentric means with the Earth in the center. And this model was very widespread prior to the Renaissance. Everybody just took that for granted. They assumed that was the case. Now, only the five planets visible to the naked eye, which is what the ancients knew, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are shown in this picture. The planet's difference were considered to move on spheres lying within the celestial sphere that held the stars. The celestial sphere carried all interior spheres around with it, but the planetary and solar spheres had additional motions of their own, as you can see there, causing the sun and planets to move relative to the stars. To avoid confusion, partial paths, those dashed lines of only two planets, Venus and Jupiter, are drawn here. So as you can tell, this is a rather complicated model. Thankfully, the heliocentric model of the solar system came along, and heliocentric means Helios, the sun, was now at the center of the solar system. In this model, only the moon orbits around the Earth, and all the planets orbit around the sun. Now this figure right here, which is also in your book, shows the retrograde motion of Mars. So the Copernican model of the solar system explains both the varying brightness of the planets and the phenomenon of retrograde motion. Here, for example, when Earth and Mars are relatively close to one another in their respective orbits, so if you take a look at position six, for example, Mars seems brighter. When they're further apart, as in position one, Mars seems dimmer. Also, because the light blue line of sight from Earth to Mars changes as the two planets orbit the Sun, Mars appears to loop back and forth in retrograde motion. So follow the lines carefully in numerical order and note how the line of sight moves backward relative to the stars between locations 5 and 7. The line of sight changes because Earth on the inside track moves faster in its orbit than does Mars. The actual planetary orbits are shown as white curves. 
so the apparent motion of Mars as seen from the Earth is indicated by the red curve, which shows the retrograde motion. Now I know this is a little bit difficult to understand, so please take a look at this diagram very, very carefully. Notes that as Earth passes planet Mars, although Mars is moving steadily along its orbit, as seen from the Earth, it appears to slow to a stop and move westward or retrograde as Earth passes it. This happens to any planet whose orbit lies outside Earth's orbit, so the ancient astronomers saw Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn occasionally move retrograde along the ecliptic. Because the planetary orbits do not lie in precisely the same plane, a planet does not resume its eastward motion in precisely the same path it followed earlier. Consequently, it describes a loop whose shape depends on the angle between the orbital planes. So here's another picture right here. Hopefully this is even more clear. So as Earth overtakes Mars, and that's at positions 1 and 2, Mars appears to slow its eastward motion. As Earth passes Mars, so in location 3, Mars appears to move westward. As Earth draws ahead of Mars, locations 4 and 5, Mars resumes its eastward motion against the background stars. So all of these observations led to the foundations of the Copernican Revolution. And one of those things is that Earth, and this is very important you guys, is not at the center of everything. We're special, but we're not that special. Number two, center of Earth is the center of Moon's orbit. Number three, all planets revolve around the Sun, so the heliocentric model. Number four, the stars are very much further away than the Sun. Number five, the apparent movement of the stars around the Earth is due to the Earth's rotation. Remember how we talked about the Earth rotating around its own axis, which is tilted by 23 and a half degrees. So that's what's causing the apparent movement, the apparent motion of stars. Number six, the apparent movement of the Sun around the Earth is due to the Earth's rotation too. And number seven, retrograde motion of planets is due to Earth's motion around the Sun. So by making Earth a planet, Copernicus revolutionized humanity's view of its place in the universe and triggered the controversy that eventually brings Galileo Galilei before the Inquisition. This controversy over the apparent conflict between scientific knowledge and philosophical and theological ideals continues even today. So let's talk about the birth of modern astronomy. The telescope was invented around 1600s in Holland by Hans Lippershey. It was not Galileo Galilei. Galileo Galilei built his own telescope and made several amazing observations, but he's not the inventor of the telescope. So one of his inventions was that moon has mountains and valleys. The sun has sunspots and rotates. Jupiter has moons, which is what's shown in this picture right here, and Venus has phases. 
So let's look at this one at a time. Let's take a look at the first one that's on this slide, that Jupiter has moons. So this is actually taken from a page of Galileo's notebook. This is his actual sketch that shows what are now called the four Galilean moons of Jupiter. The sketches show what Galileo saw on seven nights between January 7th and January 15th, 1610. The orbits of the moons, sketched here as asterisks, are called Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and they're shown around the planet, which is a big open circle. So that's the planet Jupiter. Now, more of Galileo's amazing sketches of Saturn, star clusters, and even the Orion constellation can be seen in the opener to part one on page one of your textbook. Another major discovery of Galileo was the surface structure of the moon. He was the first one to get estimates of the height of mountains and valleys on the moon. Another discovery was the sunspots. And this is really major, you guys, because up until that time, the sun was considered a perfect sphere, an absolute perfect round yellow globe. Nobody really knew what it was, but it looked perfect. And he was the first one to show that sun is not perfect. There are blemishes, what we now know are sunspots on the surface of the sun. So here's another picture of the moons of Jupiter. And he also observed the rings of Saturn. So on the lower right, you see the picture of planet Saturn which I think is the most beautiful one in our solar system because of those beautiful rings, what Galileo actually saw is the bottom sketch on the left. And he was also able to show the phases of Venus. Now this is very important because this proved that Venus orbits the Sun and not the Earth, thereby verifying the heliocentric model as opposed to the geocentric model. So if you take a look at caption A, it's a picture of the Ptolemaic universe. So if Venus was not orbiting the Sun, that is how it will look like in the Copernican universe. You see how you can see phases of Venus, just like we can see phases of the moon, meaning different parts of the surface of Venus are lit up and different parts are in shadow based on its orbit around the sun. And this one actually matched with the observations. Um, this is a more uh, explicit explanation of what's taking place on the bottom one in this case, part B is Ptole the Ptolemy's model, which clearly shows that this doesn't make much sense. And in part A, in the top picture, the Sun Center model, what we expect, what we predict with that theory is what we actually observe as time goes on and Earth and Venus are orbiting the Sun. And notice how in this picture, because there's two pictures of Venus at different phases and they were taking invisible light. Which brings us to the laws of planetary motion. Now from here on, you are expected to, to study this and understand this material. It's very important for the chapters that are to follow. Now Kepler's laws were derived using observations made by Tycho Brahe, which is shown in this picture right there. The astronomer in his observatory in Uraniborg on the island of Hvin in Denmark. Tycho Brahe lived between 1546 and 1601. Now, 
Brachius observations of the positions of stars and planets on the sky were the most accurate and complete set of naked eye measurements that were ever made. So that's pretty significant. So let's see what Kepler figured out. The first thing he was able to, to understand is that planetary orbits are not circles, but instead they are ellipses and they have the sun at one focus. This picture right here shows how an ellipse can be drawn with the aid of a string, a pencil, and two thumbtacks. The wider the separation of the foci, the more elongated or eccentric is the ellipse. In the special case where the two foci are at the same place, the curve drawn is a circle. So this is very major, you guys, because this is a big escape from the assumption of perfect circles for orbits. Just like we had the escape of a perfect sphere for the sun, or everything revolves around the Earth, or everything is a perfect circle. Well, it's not. So Kepler was the first one to realize that planets move around in ellipses. Kepler's second law says that a line joining a planet to the sun sweeps out equal areas in equal intervals of time. So if you look at the three shaded areas in the picture right there, A, B, and C, they are all equal. So any object traveling along the elliptical path takes the same amount of time to cover the distance indicated by the three red arrows, which means that a planet moves faster when it is closer to the sun because it has the same amount of time to cover a bigger distance. Therefore, it must be traveling faster when it is closer to the sun and you guess it, it must be traveling slower when it's further away. So this is Kepler's second law, very important. Kepler's third law is a mathematical expression and it tells you that the square of the period of a planet's orbit is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. So here's the actual formula where P is the symbol for period. Now you make sure that for period you use Earth years. Not days, not hours, not any other unit of time, but Earth years. And for the distance, for the semi-major axis of the eclipse, you use the unit of AU. Remember, AU stands for astronomical unit, which is defined as the distance of the Earth from the Sun. So for this equation to be valid, you have to use those units. And here's table 2.1 that shows all the planets in our solar system. Notice how there's only eight planets there. Neptune was voted off the island. We no longer have nine planets. So that's the list of the planets right there. The orbital semi-major axis is in column two and notice how it is given in units of AU. So if you look at Earth, the semi-major axis must be exactly one because that is the definition of an AU. The orbital period P on the third column, since it's measured in Earth years, it has to by definition also be one. The orbital eccentricity for our planet is 0 0.017. So if you take the ratio of P squared over A cubed, it will be exactly one for planet Earth. And you can study all of the planets in your own time 
let me point out neptune which is the furthest away from us therefore its distance from the sun is going to be very large why the sun because that's the focus of the eclipse and notice how it is 30.07 au's 30 times further away than the earth so it takes it a longer time to orbit the sun in particular it takes it 163.7 earth years but its orbital eccentricity is very very small it's 0 0.009 a lot smaller than the earth so the ratio of the period squared and the semi-major axis cubed is also almost one So you can study this more precisely in your book on page 44. It talks about the properties of planetary orbits. Remember, perihelion is the location of a planet closest to the sun, and an aphelion is the location furthest from the sun. So the semi-major axis and the eccentricity of the orbit are the only two numbers that you need to completely describe a planet's orbit. And if you look at this in your book on page 44, there's a little symbol that has MA in it. That stands for Mastering Astronomy, which means that if you log in on Mastering Astronomy, you go to your online version of the text, and you click on page 44 on MA and it will produce an applet for you and you can play around with um, the eccentricities and uh, the semi-major axis of planets. So I'd suggest you use that. It, it kind of helps you visualize what's taking place. So those were the three Kepler's laws. So you should learn those very well. They're very important. This brings me to the last part of this lecture, the dimensions of the solar system. How big is our solar system? So Kepler's laws allow us to construct a scale model of the solar system with the correct shapes and relative sizes of all the planetary orbits, but they don't actually tell us the actual size of any orbit. So how do we figure that out? Well, we use what's called a transit. A transit of Mercury and Venus, we actually, we use uh, triangulation, if you remember from before, the base of the triangle and the angle to figure out the, the size of the orbit. So transit, this is a picture of the sun, part of the sun, and the little dot you see that's labeled Mercury, it's Mercury moving in front of the sun in its orbit. Um, I want to mention this before I forget that uh, on June 5th at Veterans Park Memorial, in Sierra Vista, we'll have out the solar telescope and I would like you guys to come and join me so you can see the Venus transit. It's going to take place on June 5th at 3.02 p.m. So please come a few minutes earlier because there's going to be a lot of lines of people. I will provide uh, solar glasses so you can directly look at the sun and also the solar telescope so you can see it through there. Now this is very important because this Venus transit that is happening, meaning Venus is going to be in front of the Sun from our point of view, the next time this will happen is going to be in 105 years. So this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So if you are in town, please come by, introduce yourselves and I'll have you use the solar telescope. So I think that will be a lot of fun. So back to the sizes of the orbits of planet. Um, so the way they were measured is by using this transit idea and triangulation. Now what we do nowadays is we use radar. So if you take a look at this picture right here, what is actually happening, this is a simplified geometry first of all, but the wavy blue lines represent the paths along which radar signals are transmitted toward Venus and then they bounce back and they're received at Earth at a particular moment. And 
for simplicity let's take a look at when Venus is at its minimum distance from the Earth now because the radius of the Earth's orbit is as we all know now 1 AU and that of Venus is about 0.7 AU we know that the distance is going to be 0.3 AU the difference between the two so using radar measurements allow us to determine the astronomical unit in kilometers now this extraterrestrial measurement sets the scale of the solar system so the more accurate we are with that the more accurate we are with any other unit that we use to build on that now as you will see later on we're going to use those radio measurements to increase our cosmic distance scale to get outside of our solar system into our galaxy into our local group and eventually the entire universe so this is it this is the end of part one of chapter two so if you would like scheme over chapter 2.1 through 2.4 learn a little bit more about our ancestors and how they viewed astronomy and what they understood but definitely study very carefully chapter 2.5 and 2.6 Kepler came up with three laws that I want you guys to understand very well and let me know if you have any questions the second part of chapter 2 will be covering Newton's laws and both Kepler's and Newton's laws are absolutely imperative in doing well in this course now I know I said this before but just as just a reminder don't forget to log into mastering astronomy uh, keep track of your assignments do your homeworks in time your quizzes and your exams and this is it we will talk later on chapter two part two take care